time met, like you said, um, several years ago when I reached out for a mentor in real estate and it was a local wholesaler, Senna House Buyers, uh, Matt, Matt Trenchard, and um, took off from there in, in real estate, started buying rentals. They were kind of helping, helping me mentor or mentor me along that path. And now uh, looking to leave the job at the end of the year and go real estate full time. Um, but yeah, just a guy who wanted, you know, kind of forced with the, the oil crash um, in 2015. Uh, that, that definitely lit a fire under me to, to, to look and start saying, okay, if this pipeline shuts off, if my income stream from my job shuts off, what else am I going to do? You know, a bunch of student debt, car debt, you know, just coming out of school, 22, 23 years old. So, um, yeah, just a guy who found, found real estate, enjoyed it, and um, now, you know, is using that to, to get financial freedom and, you know, live awesome. life. Favorite color? No. <laughs> yeah. Escape the rat race, right? I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> blue, Emerson Blue. That's it. <laughs> Emerson Blue. There we go. Yeah. And that's awesome because you're always repping the. Uh, I I need to get some branded T-shirts or something because that's the best way to brand yourself is just make content with your brand on your T-shirt. Dude, it's um these polos are actually really nice too. I, I'll have to get uh, get the information for you if you want them. They're they yeah. weren't that expensive and they they're like nice embroidered. You know? Yeah, I would love that because I know we had yeah. that at Senna. It's just great. You can wear it as a uniform every day when you're doing yep. your real estate stuff and you're just self-promoting at the same time. So 100% dude. So I put on the video, I said he owns 30 rentals, but at this rate, it could be more for all I know. <laughs> own like 30 more or less or exactly 30 at this point. So actually next week, it'll be 30. It'll be 31 units, 24 properties. Okay. 31 so, like doors, right? Yeah, exactly. So a couple are duplexes, a couple are triplexes, uh, but majority of them are just single family homes. So 23 uh, properties right now, 24 next week, and it's 30 units to, to be 31. Okay, great, great. And yeah. when was the first property that you bought? I think you said you've been doing this full time, like, or, or you've been doing it seriously for about three years. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I mean, it's been, you know, 20. 15 was really the, the big impetus. Um, and I bought my first property in the summer. Dude, I was researching for several years before that, but I really brought my, bought my first property in 15 and then scaled up significantly. And then have just, I mean, Chris, you know, the market's been crazy hot over the past few years, still prices going up, uh, maybe a little bit slow down here with the coronavirus, but um, just bought decent deals, not having to buy any deals, right? You got a decent portfolio. So yeah. I'll just cherry pick, you know, this one I'm buying, um, a neighbor just called me and said, Hey, you know, I know you own that house. You take care of it. You kind of, we had a few conversations. You're like, do you want to buy my spot? And I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> you know, right next door. So, awesome. uh, yeah, man, just, just, uh, I really turned it on in 15, 16, 17. Um, at one point, Chris, I was buying a house every six weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was madness. It was total madness. That's awesome. And also to clarify for those on the call who are watching, You've been working full time um, at BP, correct? Oil and gas. Yes. Yep. Okay, cool. So yes, go on. I was going to say I interviewed my friend Connor recently as well. He does medical sales, so oh, he's man. he's got a full time income generating machine that mm -hmm. he pours all his money into like rentals. And, and are you currently? I think I heard you're renting somewhere right now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually rent a garage apartment from Matt. At Santa House Buyers. I love it. I told my yeah. girlfriend that I was like, "Hey, this guy owns like thirty rentals, and he's renting it. He's probably got four hundred dollars a month rent or something." Yeah, Matt gouges me at six hundred, man. I Ooh. tried the family and friend discount, but Ooh. yeah, four hundred square feet, six hundred bucks, but all all bills paid. So I can't. Okay, I can't okay. Hopefully yeah. the internet's fast. I don't see any lag, so it seems like <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, that's your room, your studio, your studio apartment type thing over there, huh? Dude, well, I mean, you know, when I, when I first moved, you know, we all, so I moved down to Houston for work with BP. Um, and a lot of people told us being from Ohio that you're probably, you could spend your whole career in, in Texas or in Houston. You know, it's just, there's yeah. so many, it's the, it's the oil hub, right? Um, I, I think it's diversified a little bit more now uh, with medical and what have you, but before it was really the center. So we, I had a lot of friends come down and move and we all chipped in and rented one place and we were all split in rent. It was 300 and like 50 bucks a month. So yeah, dude. And then it was just always trying to st st stack money, save it, 
pay off debt and then get ready to invest. And then real estate came in. Like I said, there was, there was this stuff with, uh, with the oil crash that kind of put everybody, you know, I think everybody kind of perked up and uh, realized that they're vulnerable, right? These six figure jobs aren't, you know, what, that everybody right. thought was so, yeah, like that. I mean, from nothing that we did, people who were still working, who were great at what they did, just got caught up because a country or an individual decided, hey, let's turn on the, let's open up the pipelines and drop the oil price by half or yeah. more, it was like a third, you know? Right, right. And I mean, that's still going on now with all the COVID stuff, people losing their jobs and uh, they, they might have had something great. And even I feel terribly like I had one lead who was a lease client and we mm -hmm. were back in February looking for houses for her and she owns a couple of restaurants. And I mean, we kind of, it kind of died down a little bit. Like, I don't know, I hadn't heard from her in a while. She wanted to wait. And I was mm -hmm. supposed to follow up with her in late March to see where she wanted to move. And I was like, I know things are kind of like with her businesses shut down, she's probably freaking out. And it's just, let me just leave her and let, if she wants to reach out to me, I'll be happy mm -hmm. to help. But um, yeah. I know she had her own set of issues that she was probably dealing with and still trying to figure out. Well, so, dude, that's the thing. I mean, you don't want to be, or at least in my mind, you don't want to be, I don't want to be the guy or gal who's definitely don't want to be the gal, but um, <laughs> I don't want to be the, the, the person who is like cutting everything to the bare bones without, you know, you can only cut so far. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I disagree with a lot of what Grant Cardone says, but he is right. At some point you can only cut so far and you have to look at the income side. So you make a hundred grand a year, you spend 120, you're going to be in trouble. So again, these people who have six figure jobs, they're spending 80 grand a year. They're making a hundred. They're fine. But when they go down and now try to find a normal job or a job that's making 50, 60 grand, they're in trouble. And that's why I've always tried to keep my expenses down, especially starting out the transition from a dorm in college to, you know, renting a garage apartment is not that big of a deal, you know, and I house hacked before that, you know, I was house hacking. So it's, um, it's allowed me to pop. I think that's really helped me some of the scale up you know, Chris, that we wanted to talk about is, you know, saving, man, I've not done the math, but I guarantee you I've saved 70, 80 at some months, probably 90% of my income. Yeah. And I, I'm looking at the Facebook group again. I see, thank you for everyone else who joined uh, my friend Stanley and David. So Stanley is actually one of my clients who closed on a house in January and he's doing that exact thing. He's basically living uh, rent free nice. or mortgage free, I guess. Yes. He's got three roommates that are paying down his rent and he bought a house, uh, four bedrooms where he's got the master space. Um, you know, you might have to tell someone to move a car every now and then with all those people, <laughs> but it's worth it, yeah. but it's worth it. Yeah. And so yeah. even if you were to somehow like lose a job or get an income change, I mean, the probability of having three people not be able to pay you all at one time is very low. Uh, maybe one person may need a month or two here if something's really poor, you know, in yep. their in their lives right now. But you're you're spreading your risk in a way, right? And, and Chris, that is exactly why I think it's better. I mean, it kind of kind of coming at this from a different direction, but that's exactly why I don't like multifamily. And I think that you mm. should scale up to have five to ten properties because when you have one unit or one property, a single family. If that tenant, something happens, they're in the oil and gas business, they might have paid on time for years, but then you're in trouble. That That is a, if that unit is down, 100% of your rents are gone. Right. Whereas if you have five properties, or we'll just say 10, and one unit is down, you, you only have 10% of your rents that are gone. And same thing with, you know, like during Harvey or all these other natural disasters that Houston just seems to, <laughs> to, you know, to bring upon it. Um, we, uh, you know, if your property floods or you have something change, you know, maybe a highway gets rerouted, maybe a big development was going to come in and it, it doesn't. If you have a multifamily plan and that's your only spot, you have so much, you have so much exposure and so much risk there. Whereas if you have a portfolio of a couple dozen properties spread, spread around town, you know, it might be difficult. It's definitely difficult to manage, more difficult than a single, single family or one big multifamily. But I think for diversification and risk mitigation, it is, it's the best. I mean, yeah. in my opinion, you know. And I'm curious when you're renting out your uh, mostly single family homes, are you renting it to like a single family or are you maybe doing like a roommate situation if there's college kids who want to live together? Yeah. So I buy in two areas, Chris, in Athens, Ohio, which is where I'm from. It's home of Ohio University. Okay. And basically that is in rural Southern Ohio. 
with a college town that brings 20 to 30,000 students to that area every year. Wow. So it's all by the bedroom. You know, what are okay. you going to rent between 350 and 500 a bedroom, depending upon your furnishings and parking. Whereas in Houston, I pretty much play in the stuff. And so I play in the suburbs and most of those are families. You know, I've had a couple starter, um, starter families where it's just a, you know, a, either a boyfriend, girlfriend, or early husband, wife with a, with a small child. Um, but a lot of it's just blue collar working class people, you know, and that's from Katy. They, they love the school district all the way down to Texas city, Lamarck, where they're more plant jobs, but still blue collar work. And, uh, man, they, you know, I haven't, I haven't been affected at all from the coronavirus. And as far as rents, we had a couple that's payment good. plans that we put into place, but these people have been fantastic. That's great to hear. And that's what my friend Connor was saying too. He's hundred percent collection through this yep. pandemic, you know, and he, he also said one thing is that he, he didn't make it sound like anything was wrong or anything with his tenants to make them think like it could be okay to do that. So he was just like, Hey guys, so, you know, let me know if you have any questions, business as usual. He kind of almost ignored it in a way where it was just expected that, you know, rent still do. And <laughs> <laughs> See, we have, so I don't know what the number is today, but I know when I was first dealing with the COVID, we had 120 tenants spread between Ohio and, and Houston uh, or Athens, Ohio and, and greater Houston area. And I try to head it off early when I was getting information about, Hey, here's some payment programs. Here's, um, here's how you guys can collect your $1,200 stipend or whatever. Here's how to file for unemployment. I was packaging that all together and I was blasting them. FYI, rent is still due, but if you're struggling, here are some options for you. And we will work with you on a payment plan, but we need to know ahead of time. We can't know last minute, you know, and we need some documentation. So, you know, we had one lady who was a massage therapist. Well, Ooh. that was, yeah, I mean, there, there's no Close. way she, yeah, she can't, she can't. So she had a letter um, and we put her on a payment plan and she just finished the payment plan and is current of, uh, with rent as of two weeks ago. So, perfect. you know, it's 100% of rent's been collected, man. I've been very fortunate. The tenants have, um, you know, they've, they've met their obligations. And, I, you know, I think another factor of that though too, Chris, is we play in the middle. You know, we, we're playing in the... I'd say our average rental is somewhere around 14 to 1500. We okay. have, I think the most expensive one we have is 2400 and the least expensive is around 750. Uh, but we try to play in the middle ground. So, you know, in times of economic contraction, the, the people renting two, three, 4,000 a month are coming back down to the right. 1500, 2000. And then during economic booms, like we've had over the years, people who are in the, the lower class are coming up. And, and from the six, seven, eight hundred dollars to the 12, 13, 14, 1500. So nice. that's helped too. Yeah. And I've definitely heard that, you know, no matter what's going on, people always need a place to live. Yep. And if you're in that price point, even if people are contracting and trying to uh, lower their monthly expenses, they're going to be your primary uh, tenants and applying yep. and whatnot. So let me just glance over at the Facebook group. I'm going to see if anyone's asking any questions. Um, okay. I know my friend Robert asked if we can post questions in here. So yeah, anyone who has questions, feel free to post them. I am checking the Facebook live so we can make sure to get those answered in real time. But I guess the question that I would have is when you were buying properties every six weeks, I mean, were you basically not spending any money on anything and just putting it all into houses? <laughs> well, dude, you know, and, and this was a very popular post on bigger pockets and, and we, we posted and made a video out of it. It's, it's the burr method, man. And, you know, Brandon Turner has popularized it, but um, man, it just, it was working so well, you know, marketing and finding undervalued properties and, um, and then taking that money. So dude, I would be buying a property while I was going through a refinance with the first property. And then to once I got the money. cash out refinance, I was using that for the repairs <laughs> for the next property. And then it just kept going. And at the end of it, man, I mean, there was, you know, it, like I said, it was about a property every six weeks there for, for several months and um, almost a, a whole, I think I was like 2016, 2017. And at the end of it, as long as you're minding your P's and Q's, you know, watching the money, making sure you're not over leveraging yourself, um, man, it's, it's tax free money. And at the end of it, you know, you don't have to buy the property, so you could always wholesale it or whatever. But right. um, yeah, I could not, I would not be Chris where I'm at without, of the Burr method. No way, in even not even close. I don't even know if I'd have a third of the properties I have 
Like, yeah, because it's insane so how good. fast you've uh, grown that up. And I remember when we got coffee before COVID and everything, and we, we were starting to get events planned and we wanted to do something uh, live for people mm -hmm. that we had to end up canceling in March. So kind of yeah. bummed on that, but happy that we're here and, and having this conversation now is that um, I remember you saying how quickly you had done this. And for those listening who don't know what the Burr method is, I'm, I'm sure most probably have, but buy, rehab, rent, refinance, repeat. And they talk about that on bigger pockets and whatnot. So just continuing that process and then you're renovating. And I'm, I'm sure you have your own crews and your contractors. You've probably had good, good stories and bad stories. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I mean, it's, oh my gosh. But you know, it, Chris, there were definitely some headaches, um, definitely heartache, but you know, it, it took two years really to build up. I could have stopped after two years and been totally fine, you know, lived like Mr. Money Mustache on 20, 30, 40, 50,000 bucks a year and been totally fine. But, um, you know, continue to work. I think I see a lot of people make the mistake, Chris, where they start with the Burr method, they get a couple houses and they think, man, great, I'm done. You know, this is, I'm going to quit my job and focus on this, but the deal flow is extremely important and it tr started trickling out in 2017, 2018 yeah. Um, yeah. because it was just prices get got too high to make the rent numbers work. And um, it was harder and harder to find deals. You're spending more money on marketing. So I think that's something that's helped me is I've maintained a W2 income this whole time. And like I said, I'm, the plan is to exit at the end of the year. So awesome. it's taken me about five, it'll be a little over five years from, first purchase of a house to leaving, you know, corporate America and a W2 job. Yeah. See if I had to do it again, cause I quit corporate, my corporate job, I think I told you in 2017 and yep. I had tried to like make an invention and spend a bunch of money and basically blew through my savings. And then I was like, well, I have no money and I'm not really, making, <laughs> I'm not really making any either. And even now, like I, I joined Senna for, for about a year and then I got my license. And so even now I'm not really lendable cause I don't have enough commission uh, 1099 income yep. history. And yep. so if I had to do it again, maybe I would have sucked it up a little bit, a couple of years and, and bought more properties if I had gotten turned on to real estate sooner. Mm -hmm. I was just so excited to take the leap and like quit, but yeah. it was a nice income where I could have acquired way more properties faster. Um, so now it's, it's nice to, to be able to share that message with those who are listening, who are wanting to quit their jobs eventually. Like, yes. Hey, you're making good money. You've got a good job. Acquire it properties as fast as possible. And <laughs> well, um, we do have a question here. Okay. We've got a couple questions. Awesome. So thank you, Robert, for your question. He was asking, how do you finance your properties? And he also asked debt ratio. Any comments on those things? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So I, since I was working with BP, they have, uh, they allowed us access to the BP federal credit union. So nice. I always recommend credit unions, Chris, because they're, they're, I did not know this for a long time, but they're nonprofits. So they actually pass all their earnings back into lower rates for everybody. So I have not found lower rates than at credit unions. Wow. So I went down the BP credit union and they said they would do cash out refinances at 80% of the after repair value. So I basically go and I, had a pro I used hard money to start, hard money. I do the rehab myself, my, fund it myself. Actually, I, I borrowed against my 401 to fund the rehab when I first started. And then when I cash out refi, I take all that money, I pay my 401 back, pay the private money lender off or hard money lender. And then I'd have a little bit of cash left over. And then I just kept spiraling that. They, there was no seasoning period with the credit union. So thankfully I didn't have to wait. You know, I know some banks wait six months a year I mean, there's all sorts of crazy things, which would have, you know, when you're paying hard money or private money rates of 10, 12, 16%, that will eat your profits alive quickly. So um, that was a big piece is a credit union that has no seasoning period. Um, and now I'm seeing more of the 75% ARV for cash out refis. Uh, but that was how I financed uh, the, the properties up until now. And actually, I just tapped out my final loan with and they'd only do 1.2 million in loans total. So, you know, I got a million dollars of debt with them and they said, no more, no moss. So I'm out searching another credit union, building a relationship with a new credit union. Yeah. Absolutely. So that's a really good tip. I didn't know that because I, I had heard of, um, I mean, hard money, of course, but the longer it sits, the more it eats into your margin. And I helped a seller who flipped a house, sell a house. And 
he was freaking out because every day was like a hundred dollars in costs. And we had a buyer who looked good. They had an offer at asking price or close to it and Mm -hmm. their financing fell through and it had tied up the house for like 45 days. And so we dropped the price and it was just, it was a headache and he lost some money on that deal. Um, so yeah, credit unions with no seasoning period. And then what about the, the debt ratio question? Um, so I'm not sure on exactly, is that like for like debt service ratio of your rent prices compared to what the debt is on it? Or is that, you know, cause most banks will lend you about a third, 33% mm-hmm. of your gross income. They want uh, no more, your debt payments be no more than 33%. The beautiful thing is once you get one property that cash flows, that and it, it actually cash flows, then your debt to income gets better and better with every purchase. Because that counts. Because as now, exactly. So Chris makes five or ten thousand dollars a month, and then he buys a property that clears an extra five hundred a month. Hmm. Well, now he's making fifty five hundred or ten thousand five hundred, and yeah. his debt payments up. But that he's netting five hundred, so it just gets better every time. I mean, you know, you would think, oh my gosh, you've got a million dollars in debt or a million here, a million there, but overall if you look at it holistically the big picture your your income <laughs> is getting bigger debt's getting bigger but income's getting bigger faster every month yeah it's yeah. outpacing the debt and exactly and that's the whole point of the cash flow is for you to be making a little bit more and of course yep. you've got to play the game i hear for cash flow like invest for cash flow mm-hmm. and then hope for appreciation type thing don't don't hope that it appreciates and have a property that doesn't cash flow because then you're just shooting yourself in the foot from the start Yes. You don't want to be smoking hopium. You don't want to do that. You want to have a strategy, you know, <laughs> hopium. I haven't heard of that. That's funny. Yeah. You don't want to do that. And that's what, you know, some people will buy. That's why I kind of play in the suburbs, Chris, Yeah. because, um, and I'm not against playing downtown. It's just, there's almost zero cash flow, and cash flow is kind of your, you know, it's your cushion. You know, when, right. when you have to do a fix an AC unit, when you have a water leak that destroyed a bunch of stuff, when you have to come up with an insurance deductible, that is where you bring it from, is from your cash flow. But I'll tell you, Chris, I was doing some math and looking at my portfolio, and I'm making almost as much money off of um, appreciation as I am cash flow. And if you look at appreciation plus debt pay down, I'm making almost twice what I'm making on just cash flow. So your debt does really become a huge, huge benefit with the debt pay down, your equity getting bigger, and the appreciation. It's not something, like I said, I plan for, but it's helped out. I mean, we could be in a, a, a 10 year, I could have bought all these properties in 2004, five, six, and seven. And then I'd be looking at a significant appreciation drop, but I just got lucky. And again, we were talking about before you buy over time. It's like, you know, it's like going like this, but it's still going up. You know, you've right. got your, your peaks and troughs, but it's still going up average 3% appreciation per year. You know? Yeah. And there's some real estate books that I've been reading, even like from the agent side on how to handle, um, objections about trying to time the market. And I think one of the things that Gary Keller says, like one of the founders of uh, or the founder of Keller Williams or whatever, um, he says to draw a chart and says, tell me when the market's going to, going to drop or change. And you're, you're drawing the line and people say now, and then you keep going and then you turn it. It's like, you can't time it perfectly. Nope. It's going to be a little bit of a lag and you don't realize it until it's already shifted. So it's better to just buy along the way, like you said. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just so, you're dropping your risk. You know, you don't, you, uh, to me, it's a, it's a relief too. Like, like I don't, I go to bed and I sleep perfectly fine because I know that it doesn't matter whether the market drops now or not, you know, I'll lose money on appreciation. I might lose tens of thousands of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars, but over time, I know that that's going to come back and I'm going to continue to buy when it's low, which again, just like the stock market, you want to buy low. You don't want to buy high. Right. And you just can, but you continue to do it over time. You don't worry about trying to time. It. You exactly. Can't. If we could do that, Chris, we wouldn't be sitting here, man. We'd be sitting with Cardone <laughs> teaching him a thing or two. Exactly. Know? I had one, uh, <laughs> one client was joking or not joking. I think he was serious, but he texted me and said, uh, will the market crash? <laughs> like he wants to buy a house. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, hold on. My crystal ball's in the shop, you know, like BRB. Let me go get that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Um, You're like, yes, but I don't know when that's the, that's the answer, right? You know, that's, it that's will crash. Answer. That's a good I answer. I just don't know when. <laughs> so we got a couple more questions. looks like a, quite a few people are watching this live. So thank you all for, for joining. Liz joined us and then uh, Tessa oh. and my friend, David. Okay. I already said David. 
So we've got another question here um, from Stanley. How big are your single family homes in the college town that you invest in, like the square feet, the bedrooms, uh, and the baths? So um, a lot of them, man, were built like 100 years ago. I mean, to be honest with you, these are not um, by any means of fancy, fancy properties. They probably built them for five or $10,000. I mean, if they weren't in a college town, you could probably buy them for 40, 50, 60, 80 grand. They're not, they're not, they're wow. cheap vinyl siding. There's, there's unfinished basements. Um, you know, it's, they, thankfully they have hardwood. A lot of them had hardwood, but they're just simple. I'd say a thousand to 2000 square feet. And I'm getting somewhere between 350 and 500 a bedroom for those. Wow. Um, and a lot of them, a couple of them I have are three bed, uh, one bath. Um, okay. Again, I, would I wouldn't like to live in that, but your college student, they don't really care, right? Yeah. They don't mind having a one bath. It's going to be harder to rent, I think, in Houston. But, um, and then I have a couple larger complexes. I've got a, a, a three, uh, a, a triplex that's got 15 bedrooms. It's a five bed, Dang. two bath on each unit. Yeah. So it's a, it's a bigger unit, um, a bigger brick, solid brick building. Um, and yeah, that, it, it kind of varies. I mean, that's kind of a newer, I mean, a newer build, but it was built still in the eighties or nineties. So cool. it's still 30, 40 years old. Good to know. Good to know. Do you have any family or any help over there in Ohio still, or how do you manage that? Chris, that is a fantastic question because, you know, you see David Green's book on investing, um, you know, from state, abroad. Whatever. Yeah, whatever it's called. And, you know, the only reason I invest in Athens is because my dad's a contractor and he lives there. Beautiful. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't even invest in Dallas. People have asked me like, Hey, I got a property in Dallas. I'm like, I'm not interested. Too far. I, have I don't a, have anyone there. Yeah. I mean, you just spread yourself too thin. There are plenty of deals here in Houston. And then there are plenty of deals in Ohio there. And um, if my dad and I haven't built a team there, then I wouldn't be doing it. And he doesn't manage it. He just helps out with the construction and, and doing a lot of the larger rehabs. We're loaning out a bathroom right now and he's over there. Actually, he's there today finishing it out. So um, he, uh, maybe I'll give him a bonus for that. Um, <laughs> We're no, on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it, that's a thing, Chris, I see a lot of people try to, you know, California investors come over. I've talked to people here. I'm sure you have too, who are trying to buy in Houston and you have to have a team because that's the only reason, the only way I would be, I only invest in greater Houston and Athens and it's because the team good agents, good property managers, um, and, and good lease, lease folks or, or title companies and what have you, depending upon what you're doing, but you have to have a team. Awesome. And I guess just before I check any other questions on the team part, who would you say are your critical components? You said an agent, um, I guess a property manager, ideally yeah. down the road when you have multiple properties. Yep. Yeah, I would definitely, so I would say a contractor or a, or a handyman. Yeah, that's like step one. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that is, I mean, yeah, that's huge. And again, you don't have to know these people right up front, um, but going to net, when we can go to networking events, you know, you ask your agent or ask somebody, Hey, who are you using? Or you just stop by maybe a, a construction site and, and pick some people's brains. You can, you can look at a place pretty quickly and see, is it sloppy or not? You know, right. I mean, is the paint, is the paint actually on the walls and not all over the floor or, you know, and just or nail holes sticking out or nails hanging out. And, you know, you can tell pretty quickly if something's done well or not. Um, so contractor, uh, an agent. Yeah. And if that agent doubles as a lease agent, if you're specifically looking for a, uh, a long-term rental portfolio, um, that is fantastic. I, I highly recommend working with somebody who knows the leasing world because Chris, you know, there's what 45,000 agents, um, you have a great investor background already, so you're knowledgeable about it. But how many invest or agents have you seen who don't know anything about investing? Right. Like, I mean, it, too many. I mean, they, they'll send you stuff that any investor will look at and be like, this isn't really a deal. There's not enough margin here. They don't know what ARV means. So that's kind of my, <laughs> that's my pitch. When I was at, uh, I would go to these meetups and stuff and people would be like, well, I have this agent who's helping me. And I'm like, ask them these questions. If they look at you with like a deer uh, in the headlights you know that they don't really know that world very well. Yeah. They're going to find you a retail house. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. When I first moved to Houston, I didn't know what a deal looked like. And I was right. working with an agent who had no ID either. And I didn't know any better. You know, you don't, the old saying, you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so you want, you know, I know a lot of people will work with folks who are new as well. They'll be like, Oh, you're new. I'm new. Let's partner up. 
strongly advise against that because <laughs> you both don't have the knowledge to complete what you need. You want to find somebody who's way ahead of you and attach, or has a complementary skill set, you yeah. know, and and attach yourself and 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 have a synergistic, you know, outcome there of uh, of completing a deal. Or like we said, go back to the lease agent who has years or dozens and dozens of leases under their belt, so they can kind of coach you on what to look for. Exactly. Finding a tenant. And even me, I'm I prefer to um, refer out any lease listings because it it is time consuming. It is its own little thing, and that that's kind of its own niche. There are lease listing agents who only do leases, and they do a ton. And maybe they have experience with the property management or with a company yep. or something of that sort. Yep. And so that's kind of its own ball game versus just a purchase and sale. So I think that's important is getting very granular about who you're working with yep. and what exactly they have helped with before. Exactly. Especially when you're new and just starting. It's like, I asked so many stupid questions, Chris. I look back and be embarrassed about it by now. Well, <laughs> you have, you don't know any better and you have, yeah. and it's great to go to somebody that you trust that sees and that can say, okay, I know this guy or gal is serious and I want, you know, I'll answer, I'll help them out because they're going to feed, the more you're successful, the more your agent's successful. I mean, Chris, if I came to you and said, hey, I want you to help me find 10 properties, you'd be tickled to death. If I stop at one because I bought a bad deal, that doesn't help you or me, <laughs> right? I had a, I had a, do you know, do you know Nikul uh, Kangavi? Yes. Okay. I cool. don't know him personally, but I, we you know of him. About yeah. Him. So Nikul told me that same thing recently. I had, you know, I had someone who wanted to buy some deals and he's like, you shouldn't let him buy that deal. Like he's not going to buy that many if he's buying it like at that price point. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Cause I was kind of like happy. I'm like, he wants to pay that whatever, you know, like he thinks that's what it's worth. And I kind of showed him some numbers. Um, and he said, let's go ahead and make this offer. But he was wanting me to kind of fight him on that because if I yeah. like you said, if he's not getting great deals on the first few, we're not going to yep. be doing 10 deals together. We're going to be doing like two. Yep. And it's, <laughs> it's, 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 you know, the rising tide lifts all ships as they say, right? So, the more everybody's successful, the more the team, the more the contractor's successful, the more the agent's successful, the more you're successful as an investor. And really, you know, if you want to add a wholesaler into that mix, Chris, as a team member, you know, I, I think that, you know, again, we talk about Senna being the only, Matt's the only wholesaler that I trust in greater Houston. I'm, I'm sure there are others. It's just the only one that I personally trust. Um, but, you know, they can definitely find you deals too. It's a, like you know, it's a lot different structure when you're buying from a wholesaler versus buy, buying on the MLS with an agent. You know, right. it's a big difference. So, uh, or a title company, you know, it, it's not critical that the, the title company is your best friend because they're legally obliged to, you know, be unbiased in the transaction. Uh, but, you know, working with them, you can ask them questions as long as they're favorable, um, you know, uh, to, to, to provide you with information, that's helpful. But yeah, contractor, lease agent, and uh, are probably the the and you know lease agent slash agent are, are the most important members of the team. Good to know. My cat's like try to rip the door down to get in this room. <laughs> I keep <laughs> muting myself because she's meowing in the background, so I apologize to anyone who's listening to that. Um, okay, let's see. My friend David asked, "Would you say the Houston real estate market is high at the moment?" I mean, I'm sure you've seen it as a realtor. I've seen it. It's kind of crazily hot right now because the inventory is low and everyone who's been holding off due to COVID is now like, okay, this thing's going to be here forever. Like I need to buy this house. Let's go look at houses. Mm -hmm. And so I'm having multiple offers at and above asking price. So it might be a good time to even sell for those who've been thinking. Yeah. Well, I think it goes back to Chris, to what we were saying before. It's like, what does that mean? High you know, it's relative, high right, right now. High to what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, high compared to five years ago. Absolutely. High compared to 30 years ago. No. Uh, and will it be high compared to 30 years from now or 10 or 20 years right, from now? Right. Right. And I can't tell you, you know, when you look at a, a stock market and it, you know, a chart and it's all got all these squiggly lines going like this, it, you know, do you really care if it was here or here? Like you can barely see my finger moving. That's the blip in a 20 or 30 year time span. You're ending yep. way up here. I mean, do you care if you bought it at, you know, 185 versus 190, if it's worth 350 in 10 or 15 years or 450 or 500,000? You yeah. know, I think a lot of people get caught up with that. And again, I think it's just, do we, are you looking to buy one house and that's it? Totally different strategy versus building a portfolio of rental properties where don't really care. As long as the numbers work, I don't care what the economy's doing. 
you know, and I think you're right, Chris, with people trying to get in and lock in these two to 3% interest rates. I mean, we're not going to see that. I've, I've been saying that for years. We're not going to see this anymore. And here we are continuing to see it. <laughs> lower so, and lower interest rates. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, but lock it in, man, lock it in for 30 years and be done with it. Don't worry about it. You don't have to worry about interest rates changing and what have you. You have that financing for the rest of your life, whether you leave your job, get another job, quit real estate, hand it over, whatever. So exactly. Um, you know, that, that, that it is something, something to be said because $180,000 house that you finance at 3% is significantly different than what you finance at five or six or 7%. Right. It's something I always, I mean, you, we've talked about this before too. We try to educate buyers on the, the traditional 30 year um, or over the past 30 years, the traditional interest rate has been an average of 7%. You know, like our parents bought when it was 12, 14, 15, 16%. You know, there's been an older investors who talk about getting getting a deal at 11% long-term financing for a property. Jeez. So it's like, we, we don't see it because we've only been buying for the past five years. We don't know any better, you know? Right. I'm trying to see if I can um, pull up. I saw an image that was pretty helpful to show that and I shared it. Let me see if I can pull it up here and share my screen for anyone who's watching. And this really helped paint the picture because it was showing the mortgage payment for a $300,000 loan by the decade. Mm. Um, let me share my screen. Cool. Can you see my, can you see my screen? Yeah. 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 That's great. Yeah. So this was showing the mortgage payment for a 300,000 loan by decade. So in the, in the seventies, well, I looked at the eighties cause that was the highest. So it said 12.7%. <laughs> Your mortgage payment for that was 3,248 <laughs> versus today. At the three, at the average rate of 3.03%, it's 1270 a month. And like $3,200 back then was like worth, you know? Oh my gosh. It's insane to think about that. that. So that's hard money. It's people's eyes right here of like, wow, you can really lock in a great rate. And you're, imagine if the rents are two grand and your payments 12, you know, 1270, you can uh, make some spread work there for you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but, and, you know, that's, uh, Chris, that's a perfect chart to describe that, what we were talking about, because. Otherwise, it's hard know. to picture it. You're like, what does it mean? Yep. Yep. That's perfect. I cannot believe that. $2,000 a month difference. Yeah. Same and I'm month. like, hopefully the math on there is all right. I'm assuming it is because it was shared on Instagram. <laughs> so it's got to be accurate. But hey, it, it, it sounds right. paints the picture that we're trying to talk about here, too. So I was just talking to my friend David about that yesterday because I know he's renovating. He bought a house, I think, built in the 1920s in oh, wow. Washington Heights. And I bought mine built in 1935 in East downtown. And we kind of bought it around the same time. He's done way more renovations and updates. He's adding a second bathroom to his house. I'm mm-hmm. in one of those three bedroom, one bathroom places. I had a roommate who just moved out. So um, the, the bathroom situation got a little tight where it's like, oh, man, <laughs> take a long shower. I got to pee, you know? Um, but it is what it is. And I don't know if I could add a second bathroom or not, but I'm trying to figure out what I want to do with this house exactly. Cause I'm, yeah. I just bought it kind of without knowing what the numbers were and just mm-hmm. like what Connor Kern said on the interview, he didn't, he bought a house in an area he didn't know about. He was buying materials for his first house. He had never closed on a rental and he just went with the flow and now he's, he owns four and it becomes easier with time and with oh, practice. Yeah. And so you just get better and you just have to take a little bit of risk, but try to do your due diligence as best you can. Right. Yeah. And I think it's Brandon Turner who said, he's like, you're not going to make a million bucks off your first deal or the odds of you doing that are pretty low. And, but the odds of you losing a million dollars are also pretty significantly low. You just want to yeah. mitigate your downsides so that you can keep going. If you break even on your first deal, you've got, you got free education. You know? Exactly. And, exactly. And yeah. So it's like, you just want to make sure that if the worst case scenario happens that you can continue to invest in real estate. Right. And I, I got my parents, I convinced them to do their first flip. And when I was at Senna, I found a deal like five minutes from where they lived and they got into it and, you know, they partnered with my uncle on it. <laughs> they, they like, they didn't hate each other afterwards, but they were like, never again, you know? <laughs> it's just, yeah. Well, and it's just, yeah, it's, if, you know, you're not going to know, but like, like yeah. Connor said, and like you said, it's, it, it gets easier every time you exactly. learn things that you can't, I mean, you, I, I see how many books you read you know, I, I've read almost every rental book there is, and it's still in getting out there in the trenches. You can't know everything until you get out there. It's yeah. A little hard there, there comes a point, I heard a quote, there comes a point where you've got to close the book and actually apply what you've learned because yes. you'll never learn it as well as if you're actually doing it or teaching it. Yep. 
and through experience, right? So that's the best way to go about it. Let me see if there's any new questions on here. Um, so my friend Robert, he's asking a lot of good questions. Do your, does your property management company manage houses of other people? Are you still buying in 2020 in Houston? Yes and yes. Because <laughs> you're managing yeah. about 50 properties now, right? Are they all in Houston, those ones? No, so I got mine. I only manage mine in Ohio, but yeah, I've got um, about a dozen to 15 properties uh, that I manage for other investors right now. Okay. Um, and we go, we do it all over greater Houston, right? We have stuff, like I said, in Cyprus, Katy, all the way down to Texas city. Awesome. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's uh, we don't go as far as like Beaumont or anything. We try to stay within an hour of downtown uh, or so. Um, but it, it, am I still buying as well? Yes. You know, if I found a deal that made sense, um, I would still pull the trigger. You know, I'm not, uh, again, thinking about that long term, you know, bought it, buying a deal this month, closing on a deal this month. And we're, we've got a couple in the crosshairs in Cyprus um, that maybe will close over the next two or three or four months. Uh, but it's just, uh, again, I just don't care what the market, I don't care. I, I hate to say, I, you know, I, I would love for the market to continue to go up, but just rents haven't kept pace with that right now. You yeah. know, rents. The, the appreciation is taken off because of the low interest rate environment. And people, like you said, are trying to get in, but the rents have not caught up with that. People can't afford it. So um, I'm seeing less deals that make sense, but there are still deals to be had. And like you said, Chris, with using some of the creative strategies of, of um, you know, house hacking, you can, you know, the average Joe or Jill can still get into a property, live for free, and then once they move out or move on, uh, either do a 1031 exchange or maybe sell with no capital gains or just go into another property and keep that as a rental full time. I mean, there's so many different strategies with that. And, yeah. And I, I read one of your recent blog posts that Liz shared with me as well that was saying that you actually suggest for people to manage their first property just to get experience, right? Yes. Yeah. If you have one, definitely manage your own because again, if you have a good lease agent, that's going to be the, the key because what some agents do, and just like you said, Chris, some agents have no idea about investors at all. They don't even know what ARV is. They'll just throw whoever is in there just because they get paid as soon as that first month's rent check comes in and then they're gone. They don't have to deal with the tenant. You do. So right. learning that whole process and then learning, you know, you'll bump your head so many times. I bump my head so many times. I mean, you know, when you start getting rent, you, you're, you're like, hey, deposit in this Chase account. Well, you have two or three properties, both with $1,500 a month rent. How do you know whose check came in or whose deposit came in? <laughs> you know, Basic takes, stuff like that. You're like, who hasn't paid, right? Yeah, exactly. So it's like, oh, and late fees are coming up on the second or third. And so I definitely recommend doing your first. It's not going to kill you. You're not going to, you know, um, you might lose a little bit of money, but the education will be so valuable when you do hire a property manager, it will, um, it, it will just make your interview process so much easier because I can tell you, Hey, this is what you should look out for a property manager, but it's so much more beneficial when you have lived it and you know already what to look out for, right? The red flags. Right. Right. And how are you looking on time? I know we've got like 13 ish minutes till 1130. I, I don't have a hard stop. So you're okay, cool. You know, cool. we're still yeah, having we can... fun. You're still having fun. I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm having fun. I got, I got nothing else to do until three ish. I think uh, my brother and his wife are looking to buy a house. So I'm going to meet up with them um, at one of the properties I want to see. So I like you, Chris, but I don't know if I like you four and a half hours worth, but you were three and a half hours. <laughs> hey, we can hang out all day. We, we, we'll talk about your strategies, all your properties. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so um, let's see. I wanted to ask, I guess when you're looking at something and you, you said, as long as it meets the numbers, right? What numbers are you looking at? And do you have a, some kind of simple spreadsheet that may be helpful for someone to build or replicate? Yeah, no, I, I give it away for free, Chris. I've got it. Liz will Appreciate be able to, 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 to point you or get you that, that information so you can share that. I built it over the years. And, you know, awesome. when I was first analyzing, pro yeah, I mean, dude, it's, it's uh, uh, I think we're on version like 26. Because that is so valuable. I mean, something of it. You know, like I just, who's just when I add up, something right? new or change it. Yeah. I mean, cause you know, like I was analyzing properties purely on cash flow basis, purely on a return on investment. But you know, one of the things I talk about a lot is your return on equity is also extremely important. If you have a hundred thousand dollars of equity in a property, meaning 
you know, the value minus all your mortgages and debts. So if it's worth 400 and you have a $300,000 mortgage, you got a hundred thousand in equity. If that hundred thousand is only making you $5,000 a year, that's a 5% return on your equity that you can go take that hundred grand, sell it, and then go and put it in the market and make eight or 9% and be liquid, do, do nothing, no tenant calls, no nothing. You can sell partial shares of whatever. It doesn't matter. And, and it just, for me, if I'm going to put it into real estate, it's got to get a solid return, which means it's got to beat the market, which means I, me personally, I like 15% return on my investment and return on my equity. So if I have a lot of equity in a property, maybe I'll do a cash out refinance, pull some of that equity out and redeploy it into other assets. Um, or just sell it, take that 100,000. So if the property just doesn't make sense, you sell the property, you take, take it and do a 1031 exchange and pile into two, three or four properties that, uh, that, that make more sense. Um, and again, your return on investment would be if I invested 5,000 into that property, say through some really low down strategy and it's making 5,000 a year, that's 100% return on my investment. Right. But if it's got 100,000 in equity sitting in, on, in it, that is a terrible, terrible way to just leave a bunch of cash. It'd be like leaving a bunch of cash in your floorboards, you know, like it's just sitting there rotting. You know, yeah. it's not, not making you any money. It's making you only five grand a year. I mean, go get, put it in the bank and make 1%. It's like, why leave it in that, you know? That makes so much sense. And there's a ton of value in that. I know you said you're on like version 20 or something of your spreadsheet because you've done it. You've experienced it. You know what you got rid of on there that wasn't important to look at, what was important to look at. And yes. I remember seeing a similar tool that Matt had over at Senna. And he yep. showed me his portfolio and how much rent they're getting for the 11 properties he had at that time, how much rent they're getting, the appreciation. I mean, how much equity they kind of captured up front just from buying it so deeply. Yep. Um, and so that would be extremely helpful if you don't mind to be sharing. I'd love to put a link in the comments or something. Yep. For anyone who's I'll, interested later on. Yeah, I'll give that away, man. Better investors help everybody out. And, and I, I've tweaked it so much that it's like, you know, I did not look at appreciation at all before or equity pay down. So I put in some equations to help out with a 2% and you can put it to whatever you want. Like I've made it adjustable, but yeah. I put it. So it, it, the basis is a 2% appreciation, extremely conservative, you know, and an equity pay down. So that adds it up to create your ROE return on equity and ROI return on investment. And it simply comes up as green or red, red, bad, <laughs> bad, green, good. Simple enough. Simple enough. Plus, we'll get you that Chris for everybody for sure. Thank you. Appreciate that Cameron. Let me see if there's any other questions I missed up here. Um, okay. Do you have a cash flow minimum that you recommend? Like, so my friend's saying he has a house where the mortgage is 1100 rent can maybe go 1500 However, the tax-free gains for living in it over two years make just selling it appealing. How much equity does he have in the property? Um, Robert, if you want to share how much equity you have in the property, that would help with the question if you're still on the call. So let's see. I think, I think he's probably lived there for a couple of years at this point. Um, I'm not sure. We'll see if he, if he comments, but... So if he's lived there a couple of years, a, um, what, what, whatever the Taxpayer Relief Act of 1998 was called, where you get an exclusion of up to 250000 in capital gains, if you hold a, a, your primary residence, if you live in a property two out of the past five years, you can sell it and up to 250000 you don't pay any capital gains. So he could sell the property, depending upon how much equity he has, and take that and put it into a couple different properties or leverage it into more. Um, the one big benefit about leveraging it into more. I know it's kind of a scary concept. It was for me when I first started, but the depreciation that you get is, is huge for people with W2 jobs because it, you basically take the structure and you divide it by 27 and a half years. So if your structure, you know, you take the land value out of it. And if your structure is just worth, and I, I mean the structures in the whole, the whole property, the actual house uh, is 275,000. That means divided by 27 and a half years would be $10,000 a year. So let's say you made $10,000 a year on that property and you can write off a 10,000 in depreciation. You pay $0 in taxes. Wow. That's huge. Even though you actually made 10 grand, you get the $10,000 a year write off in depreciation. So that's why I would take that and kind of leverage it amongst other properties. And that's why I don't like to have a lot of equity in properties 
There's other reasons. I've never been sued. We try to do business the right way every time. So that obviously minimizes lawsuits significantly. But I've heard people talk about leaving little equity in properties so you're not a target of a lawsuit. They say, oh, Chris has got a property with 500,000 in equity. You know, a, 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 an attorney or a lawyer goes, starts licking their chops saying, man, if I can just get him to sell that and get half of it, that'd be a good payday. You know? Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Thanks for the uh, the answer. Oh, and he was he just replied back and said he's got about 50K in equity right now. And what did he say he was making a year off of that, Chris? On his comment here, he was saying the mortgage is eleven the mortgage is eleven hundred and rent can probably go fifteen hundred. I, I don't think he's renting it out right now. He's kind of thinking, should I rent it out or sell yeah. it? So I would add two hundred in CapEx, two hundred dollars a month in CapEx to that. Okay. So you're looking around thirteen hundred. Uh, then you're going to have a lease fee that's eight and a half or eight point three percent, and that's going to be if you do about fifteen hundred, that's going to be another hundred dollars a month. So I would say your cash flow is going to be pretty minimal um, on that property. It'll probably be best to take that out. Just do looking at rough numbers. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I would say there's probably minimal minimal cash flow on that. Um, it could be a high equity play. I don't know, or a, a significant appreciation play where you know, it's in a, a transitioning market, like you talk about with, with Edo. Um, maybe you just hold on to it and you don't care that it cash flows. But if that's my first property, I would want a property that's going to cash flow a little bit better. Cool. And so if you, whenever you're looking at new deals and you're doing quick analysis, I mean, how fast are you able to analyze? Is this a deal? Is this something I even want or on to the next? Yeah. A couple minutes, really. Um, you're, you know, I can pretty much we don't buy in rough parts of town. You know, I buy in established neighborhoods that um, I don't have to worry about a shopping center or a new development coming in or the area of transition as a lot of people talk about. So that kind of limits a lot. If I, if I see something, even if they're like, hey, look what it could be, I just ignore that. Um, and then the areas that we do like, or I do like, um, it's, you know, you look at, basically what, what the mortgage is going to be. You can do that. You can get an app on your phone that I have that, okay, this is what the mortgage is going to be. I plug it into my little spreadsheet and it does, it does the math for me, Chris. Um, you can look at stuff, you know, the 1% rule is fairly valuable just for rough numbers. Uh, you know, saying that if you're going to buy a property for 150,000, it should rent at least at 1500 a month. Um, that's a good quick rule of thumb. But again, you know, you have new neighborhoods that are over three point you know, two, 3.3% tax rate. Whereas downtown and some of the other uh, more established neighborhoods are going to be in the 2% range. And that's pretty significant when you start talking about several hundred thousand dollars. So you want to make sure you look at the taxes and insurance. Is it in a flood zone? You know, that's another big one. A uh, flood yeah. insurance can be extremely expensive if you're in that flood zone and that could wipe out all your cash flow. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I've got stuff in Lamarck, Texas City that, you know, the house... I got one I bought for 40 grand. It's worth 60. It rents at a thousand a month, but it, it, it's, it's taxes and insurance are like almost third, 3,000, 3,300 a year. And most of that is insurance because all the wind hail and it being a coastal property. So, you know, if I, if that's almost $300 a month, if you, if you look at it, so if you, right. you think you're making $300 a month, and you're not looking at some of the, the, the flood that that could definitely be a significant thing. So, um, use, you know, use your agents. They'll help you understand some of that. Chris, I mean, you guys have the knowledge on where that is. I mean, I've even asked you questions about properties like, Hey, did this area flood? Can you help me out? <laughs> right. Um, so the, the, you just have to leverage that. You have to leverage that. You know? Yeah. And there's and, so many little know, things to look at too. Well, and you know, you know, some of the things you don't have to worry about putting an offer down, put a low option fee in, you know, and I'm not saying make offers willy nilly, but if you put a low option fee down 50, a hundred bucks, $200, that's, you know, as long as you give yourself a 10 or 15 day option period, you can get out of the deal with just losing your option money. So if you want to do a more, a further analysis on it and talk to an insurance agent and talk to these people, lock it up. Okay. We got a contract signed and then let me do the inspections and do a further deep dive analysis. Um, you know, it's never good to do that knowing you're going to walk away or wait to the last minute to try to pull one over on the, uh, on the seller. I would never do that. We don't do business that way, but 
locking it up if the preliminary numbers look good and then diving into it. Yep, that makes sense. Awesome. And we've got another question from Stanley. Have you always used hard money for financing? If not, after what number of property did you switch? Did you use it for the first couple of deals and then you switched to the credit union? Well, I used it for the first one. Um, the, the credit union would help purchase. I used a hard money for my first deal and they had kind of a, it was red door. I don't recommend them because I had a terrible experience, but that's who I used. Uh, they might be better now. I couldn't tell you. Um, I used them for the initial purchase, but they had a product that, that automatically turned into a 30 year fixed mortgage. So you bought with, if you bought with them using the hard money up front, you could turn that into a 30 year fixed product afterwards. Then okay. you still have to go through the appraisals and everything. Uh, I financed the rehab myself. And then um, uh, after that first deal, it was all with a private money lender. So nice. I, I did a 20% down deal on a smaller deal, did a cash out, got all my uh, owner finance that, got a lot of cash back, and then went to a private money lender and just worked with him. And that's where, and then just started churning. You know, it was several properties and have not gone with a hard money lender uh, since. It's all been private money or just a 20% down payment um, and, then, uh, and then a cash out refinance. Awesome. Thanks for that. Um, okay, cool. Got a question from Mo. Rental properties in the suburbs versus the city. You mentioned property taxes being higher in newer suburb neighborhoods. What are some other key differences between the two? And do you like one better than the other? So I'm, I know you like the suburbs a bit more, right? You're trying to stick more to, to Katy possibly for your rental. Yeah. Business? Yeah. That's where I, when I first moved, I worked with BP there on the West side. So I knew the Katy market. Um, you know, I would just say an average 3% out there in the burbs. You know, like I said, the newer subdivisions that they haven't built out completely, they usually the property taxes are higher. And then once they finish out and get more people paying into the property taxes, they kind of come down. Um, that's really, I'm actually looking, I mean, we've talked about this, Chris, I'm looking to buy a house hack, right? And it'll be a multi-unit, two, three, four plex um, downtown, or at least something I can use my owner occupant uh, financing for. Um, so I'm not opposed to downtown or, or um, you know, inside the loop. I'm just, the burbs have where, is where I knew. And it's like, it was my focus farm area. Um, and just the biggest distinction would be, if I'm overgeneralizing everything, would be there's so much more cash flow in the burbs where you can buy $150,000, $250,000 property and get, you know, 1,500, 2,500 square feet and, you know, a 2010 build versus $250,000 inside the loop is going to get you virtually nothing. Right. There's, there's a lots for sale near me in Edo for 215. I've been kind of looking cause I, <laughs> yeah, it's just a, a an empty lot. <laughs> Even a tear down uh, type house nearby was like 165 that sold a year or so ago. Yeah. So, so yeah, that, that would be my thing. It's, and again, I'm not opposed to any different, you know, I'm not opposed to going downtown. It's just, that was where I started and that's what helped me with cash flow. I did not see any significant numbers downtown. People are coming in from all over to buy up the multifamilies and stuff that are, that are more downtown. So I, uh, I'm not opposed to it. It's just, it hasn't been my bread and butter. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, so I don't think we have any other questions right now. And I know we're kind of at the end of the hour. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about or you think that we missed that may be important for newer investors or people who are waiting to pull the trigger? Yeah, I would, I, I think we, we hit it, but just to re to reiterate or emphasize, you know, don't try to time the market. If your strategy is to have a solid rental portfolio in 10, 15, 20 years, and leave your corporate job or have the freedom to leave it or the, just the sensation that knowing if your job changes or whatever, that your life isn't going to fall apart, then, you know, start now and buy coronavirus or not start now. You know, if you're watching this in six months and it's totally over or five years from now, and we're at even higher prices, I would still continue to buy, try to buy a property every year to two years, year to 18 months. And if you can do that using your owner occupied financing, you get 10 properties, Fannie Freddie, you know, and if you can just do that over time and manage them well, you literally, it's, it's almost impossible to lose money. You can over leverage yourself. Sure. But if you're just somewhat financially astute, 
and you do that over time, you're going to look, look back and go, man, I'm really glad. I don't know how many people look back and say, man, I'm really glad I didn't buy real estate, you know, yeah, maybe in, in 2007, but you know, now I guarantee those properties are more expensive than what they were. Maybe not all of them, but um, you know, the rents and, and, and what have you. So, um, and again, if you're looking at a long-term strategy, I'm not talking about flippers long-term. I don't think you can lose buying a property every year to 18 months. Awesome. And then I have one more question, I guess, too, for, yeah. um, for rental, like prices, is there a certain price point you try to stick to, to make the numbers worth it? I know the rule of thumb in, at Senna was like, I don't know, 200 K ARV and under was kind of the rentals. And then anything 200 or 250 plus was more of like a flip strategy. Mm -hmm. Is that kind of, yeah, I see that in Katie, right? I mean, um, uh, most of them are under 200. I did buy a property for 176,000 um, that was worth 230 and it rented at 2200 a month. So, you know, now it's worth 300 and we're renting at about 2300 a month. So, okay. you nice. know, um, I wouldn't say totally disregard what it is because that's not in that range. I would just go back to your numbers and if you've got a minimum number, you know, mine, again, mine's 15% on ROE and ROI, but if your number is 12% and you're content with that, then put your numbers in and, and see where, see where it goes. It's just, when you start getting above the 250 to 300 range, you lose your cash flow and you go back to the appreciation play. And I just think starting out, you want the cash flow to cover your mistakes. I made plenty of mistakes and my cash flow from property one, two, three helped cover you know, CYA cover my ass on four where I made the mistake. You know? I mean, that's, you know, that's just the truth. When you have all those, you can afford to make mistakes. Properties are bringing in money every month. You can afford to make a mistake and still not have to dip into your savings. Right. Right. Well, that's some really good advice. We learned a ton on this call, man. Um, I didn't know which way we were going we to go, but I knew that we were going <laughs> to talk about a lot of helpful stuff. And I like the live components since so many people are jumping on and starting to engage. Yeah. Thank you, Liz, for the comment. This has been awesome, you two. Um, and Liz is awesome. She's helping <laughs> you out over at Emerson Property uh, yeah. Management as well. Yeah, Liz is our property management assistant. She does a lot more than just that, though. She's fantastic. And I, I can't say enough good things about Liz. So um, yeah, appreciate it, Liz. Thanks. Thank you, Liz. Yeah, and I knew Liz because we worked together over at Senna um, back when I was over there. But yeah, also, if you want to give a quick plug and just talk about what you do at Emerson, I mean, I'd love for all the value you've added. I'd definitely love to give you a minute or two to just talk about what you're looking for, how you can help, um, how people can help you out. Yeah, I mean, you know, rental property investor turned property manager, right? And so I've seen and I've made the mistakes and I built the team now uh, in Houston to, uh, to, in my opinion, effectively manage some of the properties. If somebody wants um, just to have a chat and talk about rental properties, whether that's getting that, that tool that I'll give out and then share with everybody, or just you know look through a deal and say, hey, does this make sense? I'm more than willing to look through that. I, I enjoy that stuff. If they wanna look into management, again, I would push, if you just got one, two, do your own management, but if you do want, maybe, maybe you're making, you know, 400, 500,000 a year as a doctor or an attorney, you know, you don't want to mess with them. I, I totally understand. But um, if you want to have that conversation, um, I think we offer a pretty, pretty good product for, for property management. It's not one of those companies that just, you know, it's from California or somewhere else. It's a local company and um, yeah, just a chat or you can go check out. We've got, I've got so many videos and blog posts on emersonpropertymanagement.com. And like I said, if you guys just want to chat or whatever, just, just reach out to me. I'm, I'm pretty available. Awesome. Yeah, everybody, you know, Cameron's the real deal. You can tell he's very down to earth. <laughs> he's willing to talk to me until 3 p.m. today. If you don't want to. <laughs> I just ran out of questions and I guess no one else has any either. But I think we got all the value extracted from this one hour that I was hoping yeah. for. And um, if anyone's got questions on property management, like you said, reach out to Cameron, comment below. Um, Cameron, whenever you can, if, if you or Liz could send over that spreadsheet, I'll put it in Dropbox or something and drop a link in the comments. Yes. And um, it should be pretty self-explanatory, but I'm sure if there's any questions, we can elaborate or explain on there. Please. Yeah, I'm not, like I said, I'm not one of those that's, that's too good to talk to anybody about real estate. I love real estate. I'll talk to anybody about it. Questions, however I can help. Um, and Chris, I just want to say thanks for you too, man. You're you're way up on the technology more than I am. And I appreciate you wanting to put this together. I know we had an event planned, you know, several months ago and Corona hit. So 
uh, I really appreciate you throwing this together and, and uh, sharing it with your audience as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. We got to do this more often because I know it's just fun to, it's a great way for us to catch up, answer a couple yes. of questions, and then yep. I'm learning too. You are You might learn something new and oh man, who's just starting their real estate journey, they're kind of a fly on the wall with our conversation. So yeah. thanks again to you as well. No, man, I appreciate it really. And uh, just let me know however I can help anybody wants to reach out. Uh, Chris will put the links available. Make them Sounds play. good. Sounds good. And so I'm going to uh, stop this recording and I'll save the video. Thank you everyone for joining and for your questions. Um, we'll answer anything else on future calls as well if you didn't get a chance to ask anything this time. And then I'll send you the link to the, the video if you want to share it with your audience too and put it on YouTube, Cameron. Awesome, man. Yeah, I don't know how to exit out of here. So I'm going to, I'll, I'll tell you, you're, uh, the, you're the tech savvy one. <laughs> there's, there should be a button that says leave, but don't worry. I'm going to hit stop recording and then I'm going to hit exit for us so you don't.